when I really just accept who he made me to be and I rejoice and, and live in that, then that's going to bring me into a place where my true identity is going to only come out of who I am in him. And therefore, intimacy and relationship is all I need. You know, but it isn't, it's never selfish or self-centered because it's always going to be about being a blessing. Yeah, you know, because that is the key. If something isn't flowing through me, then it's stagnating in me. And stagnant water is of use to nobody other than mosquitoes, you know. And the reality is I, I need rivers of living water flowing from my innermost being so that I become a refreshment to someone else. And other people can refresh me in that when we really rejoice in each other, actually we learn from a lot more sources but ultimately, God is the ultimate source. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That is the key. Well, since everybody is saying something, I will too. Um, Mike, I have uh, four children. And my oldest, who is my son, uh, he came up uh, with me when I was in classical Pentecost. That was his upbringing. And uh, he was entrenched in the legalism and mm. holiness uh, teaching, etc. cetera. Uh, he was part of the Christian school that we had all the way from daycare through 12th grade. And um, so that was all he knew. However, he, uh, you know, he's, he's done well educationally and intellectually, and he's in the computer field, et cetera. Um, and now he, for some time, has began to take another look. And, of course, I've influenced him and things that I've shared, et cetera. And especially lately, you know, he's been calling me, like yesterday he watched Don Keithley and he called me and he was all excited because uh, Don Keithley was emphasizing no hell. And mm -hmm. so of course he's asking me questions pertaining to that. And uh, he was quite caught up with uh, Keithley teaching essentially the end times uh, was 2000 years ago with, uh, Titus in Jerusalem, 70 AD kind of thing. And so he's asking me questions about that. You know, I emphasize to him, it's good that you're pursuing and because he's researching things. And I said, keep doing that. But the main thing that's going to influence you and really bring you into certainty is God himself. And through uh, you beginning to really know him intimately in relationship. And, you know, he confirmed that he said, yeah, dad, I, I just had this encounter the other day where I felt the presence of the Lord and I was speaking in tongues and, you know, blah, blah. So anyhow, my question is, um, any particular thoughts on how I might want to uh, share with him uh, in his journey as I have presented it and help him to go uh, further? Um, I think, well, I think you're doing really, really the right thing. You're encouraging him. Um, you're drip feeding stuff, which he's then finding that God is opening up other people who have similar views, which is always good when you get people who are well known or people who have got a, a online or international ministry that back up some of what you say gives does give some credibility to it. Where it's not, oh, it's just dad. You know, it's just dad's ideas. Well, then you find right, that right. ideas are out there in a bigger sphere a lot, actually. Um, and you find that actually these things might never been heard in the charismatic Pentecostal circle before, very often for most people. But they've been there right from the early fathers all the way along. You know, it's, this is this is the orthodox position, not what we currently know as an orthodox position. So that's do it's all good. I think when it comes to the relationship side of it, um, you, he's on his own journey and therefore encouraging um, if there's an opportunity of practicing something with him, then, you know, do something simple like go to the throne of grace with a problem or, you know, something simple, really, that will be maybe engaging God on the inside. You know, where is God? Because a lot of people have never thought about any of the realities of that well yeah god is in me the holy spirit's in me but where and how do we relate to that and how do you engage that in any real sense rather than well it's there you know i know i know the holy spirit's in me but where and how does that work with my spirit and my soul and how does that bring so sort of opening up some other things like 
you know, Psalm 23, lying down in green pastures. Well, the garden of your heart, because there's a scripture that says you know, the heart is like a well-watered garden. So you can you can sort of point towards both the inner relationship and developing that personal intimacy within. But also then you can say, but also we have access to be seated with God in heavenly places where Christ is. We can be seated there, which means a position of of, of identity and authority, you know, but also intimacy where we are with the father as Jesus is with the father. So are we. So there's that two aspects, I think, that you can begin to help um, someone engage if they're on a journey, which obviously your son is, because he's obviously discovering things and realizing things. Um, there aren't still too many people out there who've put all of them together into one consistent whole. So, you know, Don Quixote has done the, yeah, the know-how and the eschatology, but probably hasn't quite necessarily done the intimacy and the heavenly encounter type stuff, maybe. Or maybe he's just not sharing that as yet, maybe, who knows. Uh, but I imagine he's on that journey and the father will be trying to open that door up for him because that's when it becomes beyond just a theological belief system to a relational belief system that reveals the true nature of God. And ultimately, I know he is very much into love and the reality of God's nature being love. Well, I doubt whether that's just a, a an idea. I think that's probably his experience. And God's got him on his own personal journey of experience. But also start with love. You know, God is love. How does he experience God as love? What does that mean? The unconditional nature of love, which, again, will deal with some of the, you know, religious obligations and duty is attached to some of the previous things that he's been involved in so unconditional love and therefore unconditional love bringing a revelation of god that shows how good he is and how kind he is and how tolerant and patient and how wonderful he is and you know then help him experience unconditional love you know with this very simple things close your eyes and be still and know god be still and know love and let love touch him you know, so those little things, I think, which are very helpful in little breakthroughs, which then can be a testimony that goes further and further into the fullness of God revealing himself and him knowing who he is in God, free from any of the religious stuff, which, you know, we've all been in. So, yeah. yeah. It, Thank you very much. It's little things, really. You know, you don't you don't you want someone always wanting more rather than feeling stuffed. You know, with a meal, when you're feeling so stuffed that it's uncomfortable after the meal and it's it's tempting to give someone too much. Only give them enough to want them wanting more. Rather than, hey, this might be my last opportunity or best opportunity. I'm going to give you the whole load, you know, and they're like, <laughs> To do much, yeah, you know, just bit by bit, you know. That's very wise. Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Hear it. Um, Mike, I have a question. I've been hearing about the joy economy. Yeah. And I was wondering your thoughts on it. Is is it is it the restoration economy that is being spoken of? Um, I guess it depends on who's saying it and what is, what are they saying and what are they meaning? Joy economy, it seems that indicates to me that what, what, how heaven functions is on joy rather than on duty or obligation and also not on money as we know it. So joy and having joy in something is worth more than what we see as the normal economy which is making profit so enjoying your job is a better thing than working to live so there's this, there's all sorts of different connotations with that phrase it purely in an economic sense if you're serving someone in what you're doing whether it's in a job for someone else or a business you own and you're providing services or delivering services or providing products 
what's the attitude in providing the product? I want someone to be happy of receiving this. I want someone to be blessed. So my motive is different. So the joy economy has a different motive when it comes to finances. If you take it in a broader context, God wants us to be living in an attitude of thanksgiving and gratitude, which is joyful. Rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, you can't rejoice if you're miserable, focusing what you don't have. So you rejoice over what you do have. So that can be thankful for what God has done, what Jesus did, our experiences, our testimony. So we're focusing on the positive, which will open up even more in the future rather than on the negative. So the joy economy also would not be based on warfare. There's no joy in war. So we don't want to be at war with anything or anybody. So again, that would be a restorational view of things. I'm not going to fight against something. I'm going to restore whether that be relationship or a being i'm going to restore rather than fight against in that way so there's all sorts of different ways of looking at that way of thinking but joy being the predominant factor in it in everything so whichever way you look at it whether you look at it financially whether you look at it as just a this is how something functions and works joy is the thing which is based in that now I would say love, joy, and peace are the three things that really work together to cement all that. And then with that will come grace and mercy. You know, because the joy economy is, is living in limitless grace and triumphant mercy and unconditional love. So you have different aspects to it that sort of broaden what joy really is. I, if I don't know I'm unconditionally loved, it's very difficult to be fully joyful because there's always going to be something which is a condition I have to fulfill and I might not fulfill it. Therefore, it's difficult to be fully joyful. So unconditional love really is what leads into joy and then peace. You know, when you're joyful, it comes really when you're in that place of rest, when you're not striving, when you're not struggling, when you're not seeking to do this, 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 this and this which is that place of rest where you're living in everything that God has done and all who he is towards us so that then that can begin to manifest in the way we live in this world and the way we're able to live in the midst of difficult situations and rejoicing and praising and have an attitude of thanksgiving, not just when things on the surface are wonderful but actually in the midst of difficulties as well for individuals all the world you know so many people look at the world and they get despair oh look at the world it's getting worse we're getting worse and worse and oh you know well i look at the world and i see the things happening but i know the kingdom of god is filling the earth so i believe god will restore everything eventually so i'm not focused on how it is now but i'm focused on with the intention of how it will be when it's restored and when the kingdom is really functioning on earth as it is in heaven. So easy to get despondent by looking at the negativity rather than on what God says. So I'm looking at God's intention, God's ideas for the future. And therefore, this is just temporary. It's only temporary. Therefore, I'm not going to let something which is temporary negatively affect me so that I feel heavy or under a cloud or oh no there's another war or there's another this you know it's temporary it may be a fact right now but the truth is everything will be restored back to god's original condition however long it takes and i'm going to enjoy this life while i'm here living that out in that way you know which is to me the economy of joy is how i live my life and I, how I can rejoice in things in my life and be thankful for it. You know, I look out, look out the window, the sun's shining. I rejoice in that. It looks beautiful out there. No, I can't be out there, but I can rejoice in the fact that other people are and enjoying it. You know, the garden's enjoying it. The, the wildlife is enjoying it. The birds that are eating from the bird table and stuff, they're enjoying it which I rejoice in because creation today seems to be smiling. You know what I mean? And sometimes, but then it might be really rainy one day. Well, I'm inside, so that's great. So I'm not having to be outside. 
But also I can be thankful that's watering the earth, it's watering the plants, it's getting the plants ready for out of winter into spring. You can always look at something positive. So for me, my attitude of joy is the glass is half full and getting fuller or already overflowing rather than focusing on a negative. You know, and a lot of the way of sort of having been taught is always focusing on the negative, the enemy, you know, what the enemy doing and you know, the fight and the battle and you know, all these negative things. It's just like, I'm not interested in the enemy or what he's doing. You know, therefore, he leaves me alone. You know, by and large, the enemy don't want to mess with me. You know, because I'll go and look to restore the enemy. So from that perspective, you know, I'm not coming from this negative focus on warfare. I'm coming from this is where I'm seated. This is who I am. Everything's under my feet. Therefore, I'm going to look at what is God's intention in every situation. And I can rejoice in that. Um, because God's got a purpose of bringing good out of every intention. And I want to be part of that. Does that give us sort of a, a bit of an overview of, of that? Because there can be many specifics, obviously, where people will, might have different meanings when they talk about joy economy. But I see it in, in very broad perspective, as well as specifically towards how we live. And how heaven works. I suppose another question tagged on to that would be, can it be a mandate in a group? Well, I think it is a mandate to, to live, live in joy and to be joyful. And that can be an individual thing because where Jesus said, my joy is in you, so your joy can be full. Well, I think that was a mandate to live in joy. My peace I leave unto you, not under the world as I leave unto you. It's beyond sort of comprehension of what my peace that for me is a mandate. That is Jesus saying, live in peace. You know, love one another as I've loved you. That's a mandate. It actually is a new commandment to love one another as I've loved you. So the real commandment is let me love you so you can love others. Yes. That's a mandate. It, it is a intention that God has for us to live in love, joy, and peace and rest. And out of that, everything will begin to manifest from that place of rest so definitely a group could have a mandate for administrating the joy economy therefore bringing that joy economy in their own lives but also looking to how that would impact the world in a way if they discovered real joy well i know the medical profession are really emphasizing the effect of thanksgiving and joy on the physical body and the mind the emotions bringing us into a sense of wholeness and even turbocharging our immune system, which is enhanced when we live in that state of thanksgiving. Yes. And we're happy. And we're enjoying life rather than being under this dark cloud of doom and gloom and misery and everything's terrible and things are getting worse and, oh, look at the world. And, you know, people, you know, it's like, what's the point? Yeah, the world is as it is, but doesn't mean it has to stay that way. And I don't have to be affected by the world. That's right. But I think the world does need to awaken and the church needs to awaken big time to joy. Because yeah. I don't think by and large is that joyful a place when it starts focusing on all the negatives. You know? right. Thank you, Mike. That was very helpful. Right. Okay. Hey, Mike. Yep. Hi. Um, yeah. Many or some of you may know I have a uh, almost 40 year old, severely intellectually developmentally delayed, <laughs> that's the title, uh, son, not incontinent, nonverbal, autistic, et cetera, et cetera. And from very beginning, even, I mean, to the point where I felt the light spark when I conceived him, I mean, felt it like, whoa. And to the, you know, when I was pregnant, I had a very, supernatural experience saying God would like to pass. Um, God saved him when he saved us both one time when he ran into the water and was drowning and I could barely swim. I saw the you know, angels keep lifting him up and I went and got him and got us, you know, saved us. All this, you know, all this in his life, I knew uh, God was preparing me for the journey with a person with severe 
uh, disabilities. And I never even really, you know, cried or lamented about it for decades. And when I did, I'm like, ah, oh, he's my only son. And, you know, the father said, I know how you feel, talking about Jesus. And I said, well, all righty then. Wipe my tears and have him cried about it again. Um, then God came and said he was a catalyst for change. Talking to me from my chemical back, you know, chemistry background. He's a catalyst for change. And one time the light went on in me and I'm like, wait a minute, a catalyst is one that, you know, creates a change or speeds up a change in a, you know, in a, a chemical reaction, but isn't changing itself. So I started crying out like, no, you got to change it. <laughs> you know, you got to improve it. And, you know, the Lord always told me that if you, it's okay to wrestle with me, but wrestle for more, not less. Well, <laughs> it is really interesting to see how God is changing the industry of care in this country for this, you know, the uh, mental or the, for the disabled, for those with disabilities, because it is an industry that's filled with greed, greed. You know, they do this for greed. They cut corners with diet, everything. And he's, he's shining light on these things and he is bringing change. And I'm watching him bring change about in my son. Little cognitive abilities at 40, almost 40, little improvements in his cognitive abilities and it's just blowing my mind and I'm continuing to wrestle so I just wanted to say it's okay to wrestle with God <laughs> but when you do wrestle for more and not less I just have to say that oh, yeah absolutely I mean I think in all these situations it's always process and something's always happening God is always good he's always wanting to bring good out of something we cooperate with him. And sometimes when we're seeing a situation, yeah, it's okay to go to God and, and want uh, that situation to change. And we can work at that situation with him and we can contend with him. But ultimately we trust him. We trust him that what he is doing and wants to do is always going to work out the best ultimately. Um, and sometimes along the way, we have to sort of focus our attention and, and engage God around the things we want to see change because ultimately God doesn't want us to be passive in any situation he does want us to be active and therefore sharing our heart and our desires and what we want to see happen is part of our, that being real with God and being open and honest with God and not having to pretend everything's fine when it isn't and when we want to see the change Obviously, there's a difference then with then you start to make accusations against God. Wrestling with him is basically saying, I really this is my heart's desire. This is my intention. I, I'm coming before you to plead my case. I'm coming before you to share my heart with you because I know you're good. And then resting in his goodness and trusting in the way he does it. So I think it's no it's no problem wrestling, but we can't force God to do something our way. We wrestle with him for God to do it his way and we engage with him for his intention to be released into whatever the situation is. And this situation with your son, it's been a long journey and you've seen different things at different times and you're you're not going to give up, obviously. You know? Yeah. He, yeah. He actually told me that Jesse agreed to his calling in the was was. And he actually laughed and said, and so did you. Yeah. It just made me laugh. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, sometimes it's hard when we're faced with years and years of things and you have history and you've got memory and you can see, but the little bits of change and the positive things you've seen are always then the encouragement to continue and not give up, you know, persevere. Yeah, you know, be consistent with it. Um, and, you know, but ultimately we're relying on the grace and mercy of God and God's goodness and God's love in it all, both for you and your son and your family and everyone else. Um, um, and as you say, God doesn't mind when we remind him of his promises or the things he said. Um, he likes to be reminded because he said it in the first place.
So it's only reminding him of who he is. Um, so that it gives us that sense of confidence in him. You know, we come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't have to shirk or be shy. We can come boldly with confidence because we know God is good. Definitely. And he collects our tears. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Indeed. I've been on the journey um, with Father for a while here in coming into my identity in Christ. And he's been taking me through areas of his heart, becoming familiar with different areas, and one being uh, the state of innocence. And so now I'm at the point where he's uh, showing me how important it is, how powerful it is to align with loving myself as I'm receiving his love, but, but how important it is to love myself. And so I ask you to elaborate on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when, when we look at entering into the fullness that God has for us, then seeing ourselves the way God sees us is absolutely key in it all because we have to come into agreement with God. You know, this whole thing of with God's mind, agreeing with God's mind, bringing our mind in alignment with his mind, our heart alignment with his heart. The vast sum of thoughts he has about us are loving thoughts. And if our thinking about ourselves is contradicting the way he thinks about us, then it's going to be hard to receive and accept the wonder of God's thoughts about us and how deep he loves us and how valuable we are in his sight and all those amazing amazing things you know and i think from that perspective you know god desires us to enter into the fullness of that relationship with him through intimacy through revelation of the truth of how he sees us and then that revealing to us who we are within context. So if I know God loves me unconditionally and I don't love myself unconditionally, then that is creating a problem, obviously, because now I am diverging from God's thoughts about me because I'm putting my thoughts first because some people really struggle with their identity and they really struggle with the fact of how worthy they are before God or how God sees them and all of that. You know, and therefore, when it then comes to wh who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe what others have said? Am I going to believe what my past might say? Or am I going to believe what God says? And that's the choice, which then love one another as I've loved you. But it also says love one another as you love yourself in another passage. So. If you you're not going to fully be able to love one another unless you fully know the love yourself. And it doesn't mean you're loving yourself in a selfish way. It's accepting the fact that you're loved, really. So loving yourself is accepting yourself from God's eyes. And you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. That is the reality of the truth. So when you recognize that you are the righteous of God in Christ, you don't have to strive to be anything other than who he says you are through a coming into agreement and acceptance and experience. You know, actually truly and fully experiencing that reality. You know, um, and I think that's a really, really important aspect to knowing our identity is realizing the things that have affected who what our identity is in the past so god says this but my past says this well okay well let's deal with my past don't just not ignore it or be in denial over it many things have happened in my past which seem to contradict how god values me why did that happen why did why did god let that happen well they're all questions which when you begin then i think to realize the reality um, you begin to come into a new perspective of whenever there's a choice, I'm going to go God's way. And 
I'm going to allow God to enable the past to be restored, healed, dealt with. I'm not going to try and ignore it. I'm going to be open about it. Father, I struggle with, with this, what you're saying to me, because this has happened to me in my life, which just seems to affirm that I feel rejected because people have rejected me my whole life. And then the father says, well, I've not rejected you, son. I accept you. Then, OK, what am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to forgive all those who rejected me and I'm going to allow God heal me from all those occasions of rejection. So now I can feel accepted because my emotions may be damaged by the rejection. So it's hard to receive God's love when I've been damaged by other people who have not loved me in the way God does. Which is most people in reality, one way or another, because they're not God, you know, but I have to accept they're not God. But I choose to forgive them, release them when they've done things which have been hurtful or damaging in any way. Yeah. If I might uh, add to that, um, my background has been in psychology and counseling, and I taught at the university level many years, etc. So. Uh, at times, uh, I would share about, you know, psychology emphasizes self-esteem. And of course, they take that into a humanistic, uh, mm -hmm. non-biblical perspective. But I would utilize the psychological and put it into a biblical, biblical perspective, not necessarily saying the Bible said and Jesus said, because sometimes, or many mm -hmm. times, I was teaching for secular universities and I could get booted mm -hmm. if, I, if I would start talking that way. But um, my thinking has always been uh, predominantly not self-esteem, but God esteem. Yeah. And in light of the fact that I know that God esteems me and always has uh, very, very highly and has always seen, uh, as I see it, all mankind in his image and in his likeness, that we were chosen in him that way before the foundation of the world and from Adam's fall to all of our falls and failures, that never changes. And the more that I am convinced of that, instead of reacting emotionally based on other people's thoughts about me, or my biggest challenge is my own personal failures where I still fall short and thus I can uh, temporarily become down, discouraged, et cetera, et cetera. But God more and more has taught me that that still never changes for one iota the fact of who I am in him. And the quicker I simply become, you know, metanoia, as Mike was just saying, uh, going back to his mind as to who I am and believing the same and acting out of that, you know, the just shall live by his faith. And as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So as I think those thoughts that God thinks, then the joy of the Lord, the love of God, the peace of God, etc., has to be the fruit of uh, my experiential realm. And, and that's what I found it to be. And I could go on and on, but, but I'll stop. No, absolutely. I totally agree. You know, it, if I am trying to create self-esteem, then it is going to be what I do. And primarily through my own works and through my own actions and through my own successes. But then if that's where it's coming from, when I fail, then what does that mean? But with God, when it's coming independently and unconditionally, if I don't match up to something, ultimately, it's not going to affect me in that negative way. You know, and I think that's the key. It must come from God. You know, that's where the truth is. That's the way, the truth and the life. That's where love is. He is love. You know, ultimately, that that's the key. You know, um, it may not always be easy to accept that but the more and more we get to know god the easier it is to accept it because we realize that he is better and you know than i could have ever imagined or thought yeah. you know mike one of the dynamics when i joined this call is it's always timely the subjects the conversation hits spot on to where i am in my journey and Dave Daniel mentioned the word certainty. And as the conversation went along and um, 
the communication that was coming forth, it kind of settled my soul. And then this last piece of the conversation about loving uh, yourself. And, and what I wrote down in my notes is to have a quick rebound from the emotional, mental attacks that come to be quick to remember who I am and who God, what, and who and what God says that I am. Um, and so I just want to say thank you. Um, I have a heart of gratitude always uh, and do appreciate. I may not say much very often, but I'm listening and receiving tremendously from the conversations and the dynamics of this group. So thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. And, you know, and it's great that people can share their own experiences and testimonies and things which sort of validate that in different people in different ways, because we're all different. You know, we all, we all have different pasts, but the, the one thing which is consistent in all of us is God, you know, and God doesn't change and God's character and nature and essence is always the same. And it's us who are renewed and have our minds and, and our hearts healed by our relationship and through that relationship because God is good. You know, he's always good. And he wants us to, to know his goodness. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Anybody else? I, I just want to say it is mind boggling to me how the emotion of gratitude released to God brings this level of his presence that, that's just releases sobbing tears in me. It's, I, I don't know. I, I just have to say, God, you are absolutely the most amazing. <laughs> Everything there is. Yeah, <laughs> That's all. No, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, I mean, God is, God is good. You know, that's the key. God is good all the time. And the more we experience him, the more the reality of that actually becomes real in our lives. You know, mm -hmm. it can be theoretical and all of us are entering into the experience of it more and more, really. You know, Mike, he's good before there was time. He created yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it seems to me that gratitude uh, becomes so powerful because if it's pure gratitude, it comes out of an attitude of selflessness. In other words, if we're genuinely grateful as to God's grace and unconditional love and continual goodness and loving us in spite of us, et cetera, et cetera, that evokes out of our spirit just, again, a selflessness of pure thankfulness and joy. And uh, my goodness, I believe that is the uh, connection of intimacy with the Father, who is always the happy God, the ecstatically <laughs> thrilled God about who he is and how he has extended who he is in us as his children and as he sees us. And so, uh, yeah, the more I think we can just simply have that purity of gratitude, <laughs> it brings us more and more into the uh, relational aspect of that sense of his presence, his goodness in our lives. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no matter what doctrines, controversies, or subjects that there are that are out there, um, this relationship, this truth, this engagement, this life, this presence, I don't know, um, but the reality, the truth of him and his love, and, and that, that's the bottom line, it truly is the essence of him, um, it, it just bypasses all controversies, all uncertainty, it just settles in and you just have to rest in that i you know i can't say anything other than 
what I know, and that is him. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, and it's good to hear. It's just good to hear different people's experiences. It's good to share the journey with people. And, you know, I love you know these sessions because I'm meeting different people all the time. We've got different paths, different identities, but they're all sons of God. And within it, God's relationship with them is is unique and wonderful um, and we can celebrate and rejoice in the diversity of all of our lives and all of our journeys and the fact that then they can relate to other people you know i cannot relate to everybody but others can and therefore that's why it's so important that we're all uh, sharing our own journeys and our experiences you know together um which is encouraging you know we're encouraging each other you know in realizing that god is at work in all of us in different ways um and that gives hope for everybody you know mike sitting at his feet to learn amongst the multitude there multitude every tribe tongue every age group every from every age i mean a multitude the the thing that really stood out to me was that among this entire multitude of people sitting at his feet to learn he still saw me <laughs> you know he still talked like it was directly to me and you knew everyone in that multitude felt that same way the vastness of his love is just mind-boggling again mm. That's the term today, mind box. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes, yeah, with God, it just seems beyond, you know, what you can imagine or think. You know, and I think that's a great thing. God is always beyond what you can imagine or think. Um, you know, and I, and I think for me, that's why it's exciting, why I, I find every day there's something more to learn, every day there's something more to experience, and every day is a good day. Yeah, because um, God is so good. Yeah. Yeah. And when I look at the limitations of what I could ask or think to how good then God wants it to be, and I can ask for lots of things and I can think quite big, but I'm never ever going to go to exceed the capacity of who God is. You know, and it's wonderful to know that God is going to go beyond the limit, my limitations about myself all my life you know and then i think of you know what's happened in my life and i think i look back and i think mm, okay i never saw that coming you know and i think yeah i would have never thought i would have been able to do what i've done or you know because it, it wasn't on my agenda you know it's not like i had a pattern for my life set out that i knew exactly how things were going to work it was just one step at a time following the journey of you know getting to know god better hearing from him and then actually believing some of the things that he's actually shown me um and you know a lot of the time not even knowing how even to think like that you know i would have never imagined i'm doing what i'm doing now you know when i was working in a hospital i would have never imagined when i was working in a hospital lab the fact that I would have planted a few churches and have done that. And then, you know, and when I was doing that, I would have never imagined, you know, being able to connect with people all over the world and teach people and help people and encourage people, you know, but God knew all that. And he led me step by step on the journey and realizing that when I think of my limitations, he's looking beyond. When I think, how do I do that? He knows that I can do it. If I'm just willing to keep walking the journey yet, you know, and even when things seemingly are not perfect, when things go wrong or things are not what you intend, then knowing God is good and he wants to bring something better out of it. And even that is beyond, you know, my present situation is beyond what I would have imagined. Because God is so much better and, and bigger and has greater expectations than I do. So if I'd asked for the what I would have thought would have made me happy, I would have asked for less than what I've got in my life. 
you know so from that perspective god is just so good and the journey is one of continued uh, blessings and some of them unexpected some of them beyond what you can imagine or think because he is ex able to do exceeding abundantly beyond what we can ask or think you know and so that for me fills my future with optimism that you know no matter what god is bigger and able to deal with whatever the future holds and i know god's goodness and grace and mercy you know are limitless and overcoming and his love is unconditional and for me that makes everything you know just more than i could imagine or think yeah yeah Okay. which i think for me you know the whole beyond beyond you know when god told me beyond beyond i didn't know what he meant i had no idea what he meant i sort of could have rationally tried to think well beyond beyond you know well it's always beyond beyond with god it's beyond my wildest dreams it's beyond my imagination it's beyond my experience is beyond anywhere i've been before and god himself is beyond what i can imagine or think or you yeah, know reason or try and understand is everything is always beyond what i would put a limitation on it there's always beyond i think well where else could it possibly lead there's always a beyond so as related to going beyond which is certainly my desire um i have been having the father deal with me i think more and more in just focusing on hearing him knowing him in the moment and thus living out of that you know for many years uh religiously so to speak i have followed you uh, more than anybody else I follow Justin quite a bit. I follow this person, that person. About anybody I would name, you'd be familiar with Mike, but uh, certainly by and large, more than anybody else, I've listened to your videos. But it seems at this point, not because in any way I've extended myself beyond your knowledge or Justin's or uh, Gil Hodges or whoever it might be. Uh, I don't think that way at all. But I do think God is seemingly weaning me away from being so attached that every day I get up and for hours I'll watch videos, I'll listen to people, where he really was seeking to bring me more and more into, like I was sharing, more intimate, relating, and knowing him uh, in the moment, that I can hear him, that I can be led of him. And, you know, I think ultimately not for self, selfish uh, purposes of just being caught up in personally benefiting from the things of God, but to be a blessing, to be able to be in a position to give what God has given me more and more to others. Uh, I've gone through quite a bit physically in the last year that was greatly challenging in every way for me. Thankfully, things have now began to uh, really stabilize. I was not able, uh, you know, for, for years I was living in Florida like a king, playing mm. golf literally every day and everything else well circumstances changed and part of it was my health as i shared uh, but now thankfully i've been able to stabilize my income once again uh and i'm in a position although i have to work to do that unfortunately uh but where i'm able to give myself now my mind my thoughts more to god like i've said where i want to be a blessing so my in in light of that you know you, you know i've shared with before my background in uh, international ministry and speaking at conferences, all of that from my days in, in Pentecostalism, basically. Uh, but, you know, I've probably forgotten more than what I know, scripture-wise. Thankfully, mm -hmm. I can still remember and, and know a lot. But as it's been espoused in our conversation today, whether it's theological things and doctrinal things, to me, in a sense, they don't mean a hill of beans. You know, if we want to talk 
uh, mm. if we want to talk about Calvinism, if we want to talk about preterism, we want to talk mm. about mm. dispensationalism. For me, it's all about intimate relationship. And I think the way God is moving us, it's going to be less and less where we want to be entrenched in doctrine and theology. We want to be entrenched in revealing the Father and in sharing the things of the kingdom of God that he's sharing with us that are really, in a sense, way beyond theology and doctrine, etc. So, uh, as you heard me and you're, you're hearing my heart again, what, what are your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. You know, where in the past our, our security and our foundation were probably in those doctrinal things and in those things that we knew and they gave us our identity and that we had a reputation or we had a way that people saw us or people thought of us in a certain way. Actually, when we begin to engage God and we begin to realize what God thinks and how God sees us, then those things don't matter anymore. Yeah, they are. They amount to, and Paul called it, they're just like refuse, dung. Yeah, you call it a hill of beans. But in one sense, it's just the same expression. No matter all of those things, they matter nothing compared to that intimacy of knowing the reality of God and his love and beginning to discover who we really are and then to outwork who we really are. And yeah, it's great to have people who point the way or can encourage that there's more and encourage us to ca carry on and share testimony of, I guess, forerunners who've said, hey, there's stuff over here or explorers who say, hey, there's a whole nation over here, or a whole different realm over here to explore, which is great. But then you become that to somebody else. You know, that's the reality. You know way more people than I know in your circle. I don't know your circle. I don't know those that you've, you know, connection to. But you do. And God can open up a realm for you to be a forerunner for them. You know, and you, then your experiences become actually for them an encouragement and an inspiration, which is why it does act, come down. I become a blessing. I've been blessed and I've been blessed by people. I've been blessed by people encouraging me and sharing and whatever. And and to be a blessing to others, ultimately, is what it's about. But you have to be blessed to be a blessing. And I think God wants us to be blessed in all its fullness of what that means, to em be empowered to succeed and prosper in who I am, ultimately, so that who I am can be a blessing to someone else. You know, and I only have to be me. You only have to be you. You don't have to try and be me. And I think that's where it takes the comparisons out of. You know, you can look at me and you can see some of the things that I've taught, and that can be a source of encouragement. But you don't have to be me. You could never be me because you're not me. You know, and for some, they try and aspire to be like someone else when God just wants you to be you. You know, and I think for me, that's. When those who have discovered their identity are not pointing people to themselves, they're pointing people back to the source in their life, which is God, who then can help you become the best you you could be. And then that will be a blessing to somebody else. You know, I can't bless someone else if I try to be like Justin. You know, because Justin is not me. I'm not Justin. I love Justin. I love who he is. And I love the, the reality of who he is because he adds something of a flavor to the bigger picture than I could never do because I'm not like that, but I can be me. And for some, I will help encourage some people who need something slightly different, but then people can learn from both of us because I don't have to compare myself to him or be like him. He doesn't have to be like me, obviously. Then I can be content in him and rejoice in in that some people are different and i rejoice in their differences because it means i don't have to be that way you know it's like trying to be like someone else is hard work you know <laughs> yeah it really is and god wants us not to be working hard he wants us to be at rest and truly being at rest is being in the reality of who i am in that relationship with god and therefore rejoicing in it, enjoying it, going back to that joy economy we started with in the sense of this is a life to be enjoyed and I'm never going to enjoy it if I'm trying to be someone else in it. And when I really just accept who he made me to be and I rejoice and, and live in that, then that's going to bring me into a place where my true identity 
is going to only come out of who I am in him. And therefore, intimacy and relationship is all I need. You know, but it isn't, it's never selfish or self-centered because it's always going to be about being a blessing. Yeah, you know, because that is the key. If something isn't flowing through me, then it's stagnating in me. And stagnant water is of use to nobody other than mosquitoes. You know, and the reality is I, I need rivers of living water flowing from my innermost being so that I become a refreshment to someone else and other people can refresh me in that when we really rejoice in each other, actually we learn from a lot more sources. But ultimately, God is the ultimate source. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That is the key.